Donnie and Dolly. The team is supported by ableauctions.ca. Closing your business, we can help. Thursday, and all today's guests, including Farhan, standing by, brought to you by the Vancouver Giants. Friday is the final Giants regular season home game as they take on Kelowna. For fan appreciation, a puck drop is at uh, 7.30, and it's official, Rick. Oh. It's going to be the Giants at Kamloops in round one of the Western Hockey League playoffs. Get your tickets now at VancouverGiants.com slash tickets. Details about playoff tickets will be released shortly. Uh, before we get to Far Farhan... Delaney's OK Tyron Langley inbox. Kevin from Calgary. Love talk at calling out players for not being in shape. Yes. Besser, OEL, et cetera. These guys struggling, step behind, need that higher standard like what the Boston Bruins have. Again, that's uh, Kevin from uh, Calgary. I know yeah. he didn't talk about Besser yesterday, but he did talk about uh, it's an important summer for OEL All of and for Kuzmenko. And he, he brings up or he hints at conditioning quite a bit when um, – the media talks to him. Okay, Farhan joining us now, Canucks and Sharks tonight, uh, Rogers Arena. Farhan, thanks for doing this, sir. How are you? I'm good, my friends. How are you guys doing? V very well. Uh, Philip Horonic looks like he's going to make his debut or his Vancouver debut tonight. What What do you expect? Do, do we see him with Quinn Hughes, for one thing? Well, I hope not, first of all. And we didn't get a chance to talk to him, which, uh, from what I understand, might not be that unusual going forward. Uh, not necessarily that uh, warm and fuzzy when it comes to doing interviews, but um, nonetheless, I don't want to see him play with Quinn Hughes because I think <coughs> there's just not much more you can get out of a Quinn Hughes pairing, right? Because he is incredible. So what are you going to do? Put a, another puck mover with him and they might get 2% better or 4% better? I'd rather have him anchor a second pair and be able to transition the puck and try to get that pair up to speed, you know, where, where you can control some play and control shot attempts and do some of the things that the Canucks second and third pairs have not been able to do. So I think he could be a real stabilizing force in the second line. So share the wealth. Don't load up one pair. Look, you get late in the game, you know, three minutes left, five minutes left, and we got to generate offense. And if he's in Quinn's shape, level conditioning, which you guys were just talking about. Yeah. I mean, that's the most impressive thing. You know, I watched him in that last game when the Canucks were trying to chase Vegas in the final few minutes, and this guy just keeps skating miles with minutes to go in the game, and he just stays out there. It's like minor hockey when the kid doesn't want to yep. come off the ice, right? Yep. So if you can if you can match that, and uh, great, late in the game, fine. But other than that, I'd rather see him play in another pair. Uh, I just talked for a hand how Rick Tockett often brings up or hints at conditioning issues uh, with the Canucks. Was that was that a problem under Bruce Boudreau, in your opinion? Well, I'm not sure that it was a problem, but it wasn't necessarily the priority that it was. I mean, you go back to Travis Green, and remember in training camp, yeah. he would have that conditioning test, right? And remember the Ole Yule Levy moment where he was on the ground and basically couldn't get up, and that was kind of the indictment and, and, you know, the signature of his entire career with Vancouver. And so uh, I, I know that both uh, Green and Tockett think the game the same way. Both men are very close, and they, they, they have the same priorities, and conditioning is definitely one of them. So I'm not necessarily yep. uh, going to say it was a huge problem under Bruce, Bruce Boudreaux, but that wasn't the same priority that it is with the coach before him and the coach after him. All right, Farhan OEL is not going to play again this season. Talk it basically saying he's going to be back next year and he expects this guy to be a whole lot better. What about you? Yeah, you know, and I know there's a lot of debate about whether or not they should buy out the contract. And I, I don't think they should because I like to push that, to kick that yeah. can four additional years down the road, I just don't think is smart. I don't think he's that old where you can't reclaim a couple of decent years out of him. And, you know, when you look at what these – American Hockey League defensemen are doing behind him. Like, they are better with those guys in the lineup and OEL out of the lineup. OEL has to at least get his game back up to replacement level and maybe a little bit above that. And maybe playing on a second pair with a Philip Rona could turn into a good thing for OEL, right? To have another skater like that playing with him. And, you know, so for me, I, I hope they don't because I think those are desperate moves. And I know they want to clear cap space, but this is not a contending team. And those kind of buyouts are what contending teams do not merely playoff bubble teams. So talk is right. You know, get into his conditioning this offseason and, and push it. Push it, push it, do everything you can. Use every tool, motivational tool, contractual tool, whatever you've got at your disposal to, to make sure that, that he's serious. And look, I, I think OEL's a pro, 
right? So I do think some of this is injury related. I don't think it's going to take much. I do think he feels a level of disappointment or maybe even embarrassment for how this season has gone for him prior to the injury. And I would hope he's extremely motivated to do whatever it takes to just get his game 10 or 15% better because the Canucks need it. They can't buy him out. Okay, listen, uh, Farhan, the CFL Combine is in Edmonton this week. The CFL Draft is six weeks away. We know the importance of Canadians uh, in the CFL. Uh, Give us a preview of the draft and some of the top Canadian kids around. Well, first of all, I'm looking forward to getting to Edmonton, and I'm going to be doing my, you know, the bulk of my prep is is going to start there as far as the, the draft is concerned. And, you know, like the big thing here is that, this combine is completely different. Normally they bring the guys in for a couple of days and they go through, you know, the process of, of um, testing them and, and meeting with them. But, you know, we, and we get some one-on-ones, but we don't necessarily get to see real, real football. And here we're going to get a chance to do that, right? Because they, they're going to have three days worth of practice and they're going to be able to push each other and, you know, and, we're going to see how they respond to coaching, how they respond to systems, and almost see some scrimmage type situations. Now, as far as the combine is concerned, we generally don't get a lot of the top NCAA guys that are that are there, uh, you know. But there still are some some other you know talented guys like this kid from UBC Lake Corte Moore is just a stud, right? And I, and I watched him play in the Shrum Bowl, and he was completely unblockable for the SFU offensive lineman. And and I want to see what he can do. Uh, in this setting, I want to see Harrison uh, Bagadiogo um, from uh, from Guelph, who's another defensive back. He's apparently a fairly deep class as far as DBs are concerned. Uh, Francis uh, uh, Bemi from uh, Southern Utah. He's a Montreal kid who's supposed to be there this week to play D-line. And so, you know, there's a, no- a number of guys. There's the running back out of uh, Western Ontario, the uh, the offensive lineman Phil Grovac, uh, uh, Grohovac, I should say, from Western, who's a Victoria kid out of Mount Douglas this year, and I coached against him back when he was playing in Victoria, and and just curious to see how he's developed, right? So there's a number of those U Sports type guys at the top end that uh, that we're going to see com- uh, compete this weekend, right? So you know me, I've always got an interest in the BC guys, especially. Yep. But um, I think there's a lot of talent that that's going to be on display, even with the NCAA guys who generally never come to this event because their, their film gets to do the talking. Yeah, and that, that event has come come a long yes. way o- over the years. Hey, uh, Farhan, uh, switching gears down south, Lamar Jackson, where is he going to end up playing football? Boy, I don't know. You know, And, and I'm trying to figure out what is going to be the, the catalyst for some sort of change in this situation, right? I'm not so down on the owners. Like, Do I think there's a level of collusion going on here? Yeah, I do, right? The, you know, the fact that – Nobody has made any kind of intri- uh, inquiry into you know what could happen here and and express interest in bringing him in. And there's a lot of quarterback needy teams. It's certainly a an awkward situation. They don't want to give him a long term, fully guaranteed contract. The Deshaun Watson contract, in my opinion, was a mistake. Right for Cleveland, they were completely desperate, and now everyone wants to use that as the comparable, and the owners want to use that as a bit of an outlier. So, you know. I love Lamar Jackson. I think he's a heck of a player. I think he's worth the money. I get what the owners are doing because they just they, they don't want to get into the con- guaranteed contract space. Um, so you know, I'm I'm not going to be that guy that puts race into it, right? Like mm-hmm. that for me is not is not necessarily part of this, right? I mean, but but at the end of the day, this guy's an elite player in my opinion. He's a top five quarterback in the NFL, and you know, and I hope it works out for him. And maybe it turns into a shorter term, like a three year fully guaranteed deal at a higher number than what they were talking about before. And maybe that gets it done, but it would be a big blow for Baltimore and it's completely holding up their ability to build that team, right? Mm -hmm. Both from what their cap is going to look like and from other players just wanting to come play, not knowing who the quarterback's going to be. So curious to see if it gets solved because, um, you know, with him not being as, with him not having an agent and with the CFL or with the NFL PA involved the way they are, there's just so many layers to this situation that aren't, um, that just isn't like a normal contract negotiation. Farhan, something you, you said there, and uh, you're, you're much more dialed in than I am when it comes to what's going on down south. Please tell me that race still isn't an issue when it comes to NFL quarterbacks. Um, I don't I don't think it is, to be honest, right? I mean, you know, we, we just saw two, uh, two African-American quarterbacks play in the Super Bowl, and, and Mahomes is clearly, clearly the best quarterback in the league. And look, I mean... The fact that they paid Deshaun Watson what they did with all that other baggage hanging over his head probably tells you something. And, and when you've got teams as desperate as they are and as quarterback needy as they are, 
I just don't think that's going to be a thing anymore, right? So if you can play, you're going to get your opportunities, right? I mean, when you look at, for example, um, uh, Anthony Richardson, the, the quarterback yep. from, uh, from Florida, and Will Levis, the quarterback from Kentucky, one is black, one is white, and both of them have similar criticisms. You, you know what I mean? Like yep. they question the accuracy and the consistency on both guys. And so I, I just, you know, and, they, and they, they admire the arm talent on both guys. So I'm not convinced that it's necess- you know, that it's the issue that it was, right? So, you know, and I'm just going through a podcast series yep. on the athletic called Between the Lines, which is a fantastic series, and it does paint a picture. It's more of a historical look, and I think race is an issue when it comes to coaches, uh, you know, and, and ownership and, and those kinds of things. But I do think it's gone past where, you know, as far as quarterbacks are concerned, I don't think that's an issue anymore. But I do believe it is in other parts of the NFL. Yeah. I just think it's just so sad that Warren Moon wasn't that long ago. And, uh, you know, he had to come up to uh, It wasn't to that Canada. long ago. It, it, yeah. You know, relatively it was now. We're just old, right? And, yeah. And we, re- we, remember, we remember that. But that was 40 years ago, right? Like, yeah. My, you know, my first, the first college football game I ever watched was Warren Moon at the University of Washington. Like, that's a, I'm 54 now, man. That's a lifetime ago. Next year, I qualified for the seniors discounted IHOP. So it's been a minute. I thought you were there already. I'm 10 years in. I'll see you there. I'll see you there in a couple of weeks. <laughs> see you guys. Okay, Farhan, I appreciate it.